Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to let you guys get settled in. We, we uh, were working on a couple of things. So um, when you guys enter the room, uh, you can use the Q&A. Um, the Q&A to send questions to Mrs. Hernandez. And if you're watching us on YouTube, you can go ahead and put the uh, questions in the chat and we will relay them into Mrs. Hernandez. So without further ado, I'll leave it to you, Mrs. Hernandez. Hi, welcome back everyone. We're gonna watch a little clip here for just a moment. There's a flyover of the old LG company right over the factory in Elgin at Watch. video clip that's um, available on YouTube called House of Wonders. It's 23 minutes long. We're going to swing back to that just a little segment at minute 18 or so. Um, but I'm going to start here at uh, a little bit of the history of the building and why the U46 Planetarium also has an observatory attached um, that we never use. See, it turns out that the front part of the building, the observatory is 110 years old and it was built by the Elgin National Watch Company. The back part that you can barely see from the street is the school district U46 planetarium. Now we've had that part, we've had the building for the last 60 years. It was originally built 110 years ago and that front part of the building has the telescope. They had that telescope built so they could, they could ascertain the exact correct time here at the observatory to send a signal over to the factory that was just a few blocks away that made Elgin watches so that they could check every single watch as it came off the press to make sure that it was measuring time absolutely correctly to the nearest hundredth of a second before they sold it off to the public. So it made Elgin watches excellent. Now they did go out of business and they were here in Elgin for almost a hundred years. They uh, started in 1864. In 1960, uh, the company was, was out of business, going out of business and they deeded this observatory building to the school district. It was either that or tear it down. So we took it and three years later, we built the planetarium that's way in the back. If you look at a side view of the building, it looks like that. And the planetarium part in the back is pretty big. And that's why I can generally fit two classes in there at one time. And um, you know, for the last 50 some years, students have been coming year all, all school year, um, four, maybe five groups a day, every day for lessons in the planetarium that is attached to the old watch company observatory. Now the observatory, um, is the room where the telescope is. The ceiling opens. It looks like this on the inside. There's a crank that opens that door. You crank it by hand. It's not electric. The telescope looks like that. And it doesn't turn left or right. It hasn't been used to measure time since the 1940s. And it's a telescope that's made for just measuring time. It measures the spin of the earth. That's our 24 hour time marker is the spin of the earth. And it studies, it watches stars at night as they cross the meridian line, that line that connects north to south in the sky over your head. And they used that movement to calculate exact time down to the nearest fraction of a second. Now it took some calculating and there was a lot of legwork to be done. And it turns out that they used uh, the Washburn Observatory up at University of Wisconsin-Madison to compare crossings of stars to figure out exactly where our telescope was on planet Earth as far as longitude. Um, so what they did was they, two astronomers through their telescopes on the same night would watch for the same exact star when it was exactly north-south and they would telegraph 
and it turns out that it's about a four minute difference. So that tells us that we are exactly four minutes east of Madison, Wisconsin. In other words, it's almost perfectly straight north from here in Elgin. And once they knew the exact longitude here, um, they were able to look up the crossings of stars for every date of the year in a book. And every night they would check the star crossing to see that it was correct with the time that we had on our clocks. So that telescope doesn't turn left or right. The ceiling doesn't turn left or right. The, the door doesn't open any more than that. It was just meant to look straight ahead and measure the earth spinning by watching the stars go by. It would spin up, it would uh, go up and down. And if you look at this next picture, that the axis that goes across here, that, that's where it can move up and down, but this telescope doesn't turn any which way. So um, it makes no sense to come here and look through this telescope because, well, you can't turn it to aim at anything that you wanna look at. It looks exactly north-south at what happens to be in front of it. Now, every 24 hours, the sun goes by for a few minutes right in front of that door. Every 24 hours, the moon goes by. Every 24 hours, all of our visible stars go by. So you could go up there at a certain time and watch something go by, but it only lasts a couple minutes in the telescope as it goes past. It's not a super strong telescope anyway. It was never meant to look um, at outer space objects or nebula or to find cool pictures of Saturn or Pluto. It was just enough to watch the stars go by very clearly. It was opened by a guy named William Payne. I'm going to try to tell you a few things that I've not, I don't normally share in programs when you're at the planetarium. And this guy, William Payne, he was actually an astronomer from Minnesota, but he was also a meteorologist, which that was barely even a term back then. Like he, he, he tracked weather and he was involved in this thing called like a weather service or the weather bureau up in Minnesota. And um, when he was an adult and running that weather bureau, the US government sent um, a military, um, uh, I think it was army uh, guy to the post out there. And he was to start a, a signal station. And it turns out they kind of butted heads a little bit. And there's a whole book about it called The Children's Blizzard of 1888. Um, because Professor Payne up there in Minnesota, where they sent this military guy to start this signal thing for the military, um, they butted heads because Professor Payne already had set everything up up there. And then they sent this guy out to the middle of nowhere. And there's reasons why they send army guys out to the middle of nowhere. And, and he was there because he didn't really want to be there. So um, they argued a lot, but it turns out in 1888, there was a humongous storm that went through the Dakotas and Minnesota in January. It was, it was one of the most intense in st storms ever across the country as far as um, the drop in barometric pressure. And uh, children had been sent to school that day in January because it had been a really cold winter except for those few days. And by 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, the wind turned um, almost perfectly parallel to the ground. So it, the wind picked up so much that teachers knew right away that something was going on and they sent children home. And many of them did not um, make it all the way home because the weather turned so quickly and there's a whole entire book on it. Now I'm gonna circle back to this meteorology thing with Professor Payne. Um, and there were um, of course other directors after Professor Payne uh, Frank Erie was there as an assistant director with Mr. Payne for a long time, and he was the second director. And then there was a fellow named Ray, Dot, Ray Nyday and, and Robert Miller. Um, but Frank Erie was the director of the observatory when they made House of Wonders. It was guessed at about 1930 to 32, this video I was showing at the beginning. And if I fast forward to this um, stop at 18 minutes, so I'm going to fast forward it to the 18 minute mark and there's something really, really neat. Oops, you don't really see that. And it, it shows that second director actually looking through the telescope and using it. As intended, and you can see the star crossing and that's all that they did there they watch the stars go by. That's what that telescope is for. It's to watch the stars go by. It's not to look for um, uh, amazing things, uh, nebula in the sky or anything. 
It's meant to just watch the stars go by. So here's quitting time. It's the front of the factory right there. There's the mention of the very observatory that's attached to the planetarium. There it is, without the planetarium. About 1930. Frank Urey getting ready for his observations for that evening. The telescope looks very shiny. Relatively new. And you'll see a star cross. And that's what they did every night. They watched about 12 stars go by and carefully measured them the moment they were in the exact middle of the telescope. And they figured that out by using spider webs across the eyepiece. So there goes the star. Every moment it crossed a line, the observer would hit a button that he had in his hand, which you got to realize hitting a button on a telescope in 1910, really, really very high tech. And that's what they did. That's exactly what they did at the observatory. They did that about 12 times a night. They just waited for stars to cross so they could watch them go by. I have some of the um, original pieces still from the uh, measuring of the time. This is called a chronograph. A pen would sit in here. And when Mr. Yuri or whoever was at the telescope, they'd hit the button and a pen that was in here would do a little jump, a little electrical jolt would cause it to jump. Well, this drum was spinning one time every minute according to the master clocks that we had in the building. And slowly this carriage that started here would move all the way to the left. Well, that was about 12 hours worth of time, but every second that it made a jump because the dude hit the button at the telescope, there's the button, it would make a little jump. Anywhere that you see a double jump, that's when somebody hit the button. These single jumps, that's just one second of time. So they could look in their book at the time a star was supposed to cross, and then they would look for the moment where they hit the button and say, whoa, look at that, wait a minute, that was supposed to cross at 1253.57, and it looks like it was 1253.042. And then they would subtract that out and they could figure out how much they needed to correct their clock for the day because the clock was off a little bit. The stars are never off. The earth never spins unevenly. It was always the human made clock that would be off a little bit. So they would adjust it. And um, in order to make sure that they knew that the telescope was straight on meridian, exactly north south, that the stars were crossing exactly on the north south meridian, they had to figure out their exact longitude, which they did. These are the scribblings from uh, Professor Comstock in Wisconsin and from Professor Payne here in Elgin, and they figured out we were four minutes away. After they did that, they built um, a concrete obelisk, and then they put this little shed around it. That's actually a hole, and there's a super bright light inside there, and it's lined up exactly north of the middle of the telescope. So when you looked through the telescope, if you aimed it towards that house, now here's the concrete structure that that house was built around. And that is exactly north. Like if you walked that way out of the, the observatory, you would actually end up at the North Pole if you kept on walking. This is exactly due north. So every night they would align the telescope with that hole and look for the light and make sure it was in the middle of the eyepiece to know that it didn't do any settling. Now, if I fast forward, if I, if I zoom in a little bit, right here, there's four metal posts in the ground. Well, those, are, those actually held up a box that was a weather station that Professor Payne agreed to monitor for the people in Springfield, because in Springfield, there was a weather bureau, and they knew he was, he was a scientist that could accurately measure the tools that they were using in early meteorology in the country. And from 1910 until, um, I'm not sure the exact year, I think all the way into uh, the early 1990s, the equipment that was out there, uh, the information was sent down to Springfield every single day by the secretary.
So there's that iron post and that's what that obelisk looks like. It's still there on the property right outside, well, directly north of the telescope. This is another device I, I don't often mention. It's upstairs in the observatory room as well. Um, it's attached to the wall, it's pretty heavy. It's got these handle grips on it um, and it's a level tester. Okay, if I open the door, you can see those grips right there because you can lift this part of this device up off of this contraption on the bottom that actually measures this level to make sure that the level is level. Let me show you what I mean. If I look up above, there's those handles. I can tell you right here, this is a level. There's the water in it, here's the bubble. So right now it's not level because it should be in the middle if it was really level. But you can take this whole contraption off, turn around and set it on the telescope. It's right here, here's the grip. Here's the other grip. And it hooks on these curved hooks on the top. Well, somebody could walk up to this telescope and look at the level and make sure, well, that the telescope was still level compared to the day before. They didn't want any settling or, or an earthquake to potentially uh, move the base of the telescope. If they did, their measurements would be off and their time wouldn't be exactly correct. So that was another way that they made sure that the telescope was perfectly aligned north-south every day. And that, that place where it was sitting, that contraption also makes sure that the level is level. There's a way that you can check using that device, which is pretty amazing. We still have the original regulator clocks. They're in the basement. Uh, the room was temperature controlled by light bulbs. That was the heat for the room. More would turn on if it needed to warm up and they would automatically turn off if it needed to cool down. And it looked like that close up. Oh, they're the opposite of energy efficient. They're very, very hot. So as soon as a, a row of those light bulbs would turn on, the room would definitely warm up. So here's what the factory looked like at about 1900, maybe 1908 or so when the um, observatory was built right along the back side of the building over here. This is National Street. If I go down National Street and then turn right, I would be at the observatory. You could actually see the clock tower from our steps at one time. Going into the Planetarium Observatory, you can see right there is the clock tower from the factory and a whole wing of the factory. Now it is gone. They went out of business in the 1950s, 60s. It was after World War II uh, that they started losing um, um, purchasers of their watches and they never really recovered. So they kind of slowly went out of business from the 1940s through the 50s. 1960, they were done for and the building was in very deteriorated condition. So it was torn down in the late 1960s. And now in its place where the factory used to be, we have Clock Tower Plaza. They named it Clock Tower Plaza to honor the old factory that was there. And I just wanna point out this, this pillar, maybe we could call it a chess piece that's in front of that shopping center that you might know right over here to the right is where there's a Dunkin' Donuts and, and there's a subway straight into the left. And this fencing is right out in front of it. There's Butera's there. There's a marker as you pull in that tells you about that. That is the site of the old watch company factory. A little bit up the street, there's this depot. This was a, a passenger depot. It wasn't, it didn't ship watches out anywhere. Um, but if you're at this depot at National Street, if you, if you turn and look down the hill, you're actually looking towards the old factory. So you can see the hill goes down this way. If you look that way in about 1950 or so, it looked like this. And if you look really carefully down the sidewalk, you can see the, those pillars are still there. And this black fencing went all the way around the property. It went around the entire factory at one time. These three cars are all stopped at Grove Street. So this is Grove and National. This goes over the river right here. If I went down Grove Street a little bit and turned around, well, today I'd be right next to the parking lot of the Grand Victoria Casino. But if you look down towards National Street, that's what you would have seen before they took the factory down. But look, you can still see the pillars. Those are the same ones that are in front of the store today where that entrance is. That's the same entrance that you use to go to Butera and Family Dollar. Just another picture of the same thing. The bike path is right in front of us. So this photographer has uh, the river right behind him or her. And if, if you look really carefully, you can see those two pillars right there at National and across the street here where these people are, that's Grove Street. And you know, Elgin Watches had a logo, Father Time. And he's 
holding an Elgin watch instead of an hourglass, you know, the hourglasses at his feet, like out with the old and in with the new. This was always their logo. And there's an older version of the same thing. And it's kind of neat in that video in the beginning, they show the uh, flyby of this clock in downtown Chicago. This is not from the clock tower in Elgin. This is in downtown Chicago. And it was commissioned by the watch company to be put on their building of their main offices, which was in Chicago. And it said Elgin time on it on all four sides. And of course, Father Time's holding an Elgin watch because it was Elgin who installed this clock. They didn't build it. They didn't make clocks. They made watches. Um, but I went a couple of years ago downtown 2014 and I found it. It's still there. It's at Jewelers Row in Chicago, which is Oh gosh, Wabash was one of the cross streets, I think. Um, but if you look carefully, there's some differences. It still works. It really was 10 after 10 in the morning. But he's holding an hourglass again. They actually took the watch out of his hand and it doesn't say Elgin time anymore. It just says time because now we can get time from the National Bureau of Time Standards. You don't need to um, have a direct connection to Elgin to know the exact time anymore. In other words, it's wireless now. Um, but back then it was wired through the utility lines to downtown Chicago. So the time on this clock was coming from the very observatory we just saw pictures of. It's a really, really neat piece. So Elgin watches, super famous. You would wind them on the back or wind them up here. The factory was amazing in Chicago. It was absolutely enormous. This is National Street right here. There's quitting time again, a little bit later, maybe 1950s, late 40s. And the observatory building was used for a number of things, um, even after they quit using it to measure time, which they quit using it to measure time in the 1940s because after that you could get time wireless. Um, and here is, um, I think this is Ray Nide doing some work at the um, with the radio room, and here's a setup that they had in that room at one time testing um, Duro springs, the 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 spring, the mainspring that they used in the watches. Um, they did some research uh, in the very building where the planetarium sits um, at one time. So there's a very old picture, well before. There's no planetarium on the back, you can see. You can see there's some holes in the top of this window. Well, it was a special ventilator they put in because they were doing some research on some metals in that building back um, in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, uh, when they were um, using it as a research facility. There's also a neat connection to the World's Fair. Last thing here. Um, in, in the Chicago World's Fair, there was this new thing that was developed partly through uh, University of Illinois called a photo cell. And it took light energy and it changed it into an electrical impulse. They're super common nowadays, but it was the new thing. So they decided that uh, one of the universities that helped develop this would aim a telescope at the star Arcturus that is about 40 light years away and 40 years before this World's Fair was the Columbian Exposition in Chicago. And they thought it'd be neat that the star, the light that left that star during the last World's Fair in Chicago would just reach the telescope that night. And they would put that light energy on the photo cell to change it into an electrical impulse to turn on the lights. And that's what they did. And it was really neat, but the university didn't do that every night, the, the Elgin. National Watch Company Observatory did. This is a picture from right on the back side up on the hill at the observatory. They had a telescope set up and this is the setup that turned on the lights at the fair every night during the Chicago World's Fair. Here's looking from a different direction. This is looking from kind of the building is right behind me and I can see right here there's a mansion. There was a really big house next to the observatory not where the apartments are today. It was the Collingborn Mansion. Um, and there's a, a house that I think is still there. It's just the first one on the other side of the apartment buildings. And that old building looked like this originally, cool Mansford roof. And they, they enclosed that porch at one time. So the porch is a little bit bigger here. Um, but right over here to the left of it, that's where the observatory is. So I contacted the family. Some of them are still um, connected to Elgin. And they sent me some old pictures. 
And here we have um, probably Mr. Collingborn walking one of the kids on a pony. And you can see the observatory right behind them. And here's another one with the mom in the play yard with several of the kids. And look on the right hand side of this image, you see the edge of the observatory. So that mansion was right next to the observatory at one time. Um, it was since torn down and now there's an apartment building there. So Elgin watches, GM Wheeler watches, watches had names. Um, and notice they use the observatory in the ad. Time from the stars was often in their ads. The lady and Lord Elgin were like the top of the line fancy ones. And look, they mentioned the observatory in this ad. Elgin watches were famous. Elgin made watches famous. Or did the watches make Elgin famous? Or did the observatory make the Elgin watches famous? Or is it all three? I'd say probably all three. So in 1960, when the watch company was out of business, they gave it to us. Within three years, we built that planetarium in the back. The first director here in the planetarium was um, Mr. Don Tuttle. He was here for 25 years. The second director was Gary Coutina. He was here for almost 25 years as well, full time. And many of us do remember uh, Mr. Tuttle. There he is in his early years with one plaid ties on working at the Spitz A3P star projector that's still in use and a beautiful piece of machinery that shows us the night sky. Uh, Mr. Tuttle actually installed the projector side by side with the employees from Spitz. They used Elgin Public Schools uh, in their advertising brochure for the year after 1964. And here he is at work and this is the original console that I still use today in star shows and that's the original star ball and the original A3P Spitz star projector, still in use today. It was a big deal in the school district. This is the March 1963 newsletter for your Elgin Public Schools. And there's a whole article about the planetarium being stalled over the summer to open in September of 1963. And here it is, the very first week of planetarium visits. Started out with seventh grade from I don't know what school and then a Laurel Hill visit in the afternoon. Here's the second day and the third day, and on we go. Mr. Tuttle knew that he needed help in the building. At the end of the first year, he was so busy. So he put in a requisition order for um, a secretary to be hired. And that secretary was the famous Nancy Topolowski, Nancy Franklin, she later was. And here she is working on some solar filters in the office. And she did some amazing work in the planetarium with her art and photography skills. This is one of her makings for um, a December program. And I'm sure it's she taking this picture right here of these happy children coming into the planetarium with their teacher. And it turns out that that was the 500,000th student that visited the planetarium. We are now over 1 million visitors to the planetarium. This is October of 84. And look how excited she is to win that teacher's quiz. I'm hoping the photographer just caught her at a bad moment and she was real happy to receive that from Mr. Tuttle. Gary Coutina during his reign um, famously got the building put on the National Register of Historic Places. So that and photography and the slide shows that he helped to create were uh, an amazing contribution. And here the three are Don Tuttle, Nancy Topolowski Franklin, and then Gary Coutina on the left. So we're gonna go to the night sky. Remember, when you, you're going to go out and do some observing, please check the path before it gets dark. Make sure you're not going to trip and fall in a hole or anything that's laying um, out in the grass. But with an adult, know that you won't need your flashlight. As a matter of fact, a flashlight and a white light from the cell phone is really bad for your night vision. So you don't want to use those unless you have them covered with some kind of red um, material. And I do also want to point out we have lots of crossings of the International Space Station this week. Um, and the thing is, they're not as bright as they were. Remember, they were negative threes and fours the last couple of weeks, week and a half, and now they're down to negative one. Oh, that's still pretty bright, brighter than the brightest star in the sky. Um, and they're not quite as high. At the highest point, you want it to be at least over 20. So that one, that one was okay. We're right around that 20 mark, but tomorrow or later this week on May 26th, we're gonna have one that goes, um, well, that one's still only 26. The one before it on the 25th would be better at 11 p.m. And then on the 27th and the 28th, we've got them at 10 and 11 p.m. 
going up pretty high and those are up to a negative three and a negative two. This is the heavens above website. That's where you wanna go to check for those crossings along with any new Starlink information um, that happens to come along. And there hasn't been any news on that Starlink 8 as of this week. So let's switch over. We're going to um, move on to the Stellarium part of the program where we look at what's up in the sky tonight. Remember there's this recording and all the other recordings that we've done in this series are on the U46 science website. Uh, National Biodiversity Teach-In is what NBTI stands for. You can find the link to it on the Planetarium portal. Super easy to get to. Just go to the U46 website under departments, click Observatory Planetarium, and right there will be a link to go to the portal where you can access all of this. Okay, so let's switch over to today. Here we are right now. And can, Deb, are we okay? Can you see my screen? Yes, you're set up perfect. Okay, so this is set up for 1.30 right now. That's our time right now. I'm gonna put up a date time window. And I like it right over there in the corner, just so I can see it. it's a little bigger. Here's May 21st, 2020. That's where we are right now. I'm fast forwarding time a little bit. And you might be noticing there's a circle underneath that says moon. Well, that's because that's where the moon is right now. Now, if you were to go outside, if it were sunny, and it's sunny here at the moment, you would never see this. That's because we're on the night of a new moon, we're very near the moon passing right underneath the sun. And that sun is so bright, you would never ever see the moon in the sky during a new moon. And notice they, they're going at the same speed. They both disappear at sunset. So all night tonight will be a great star watching night because there will not be a moon in the sky. It is not a good moon watching night. But if we let the sun go down, sets at about 810 tonight, but I want to go to about nine o'clock, maybe even a little more. 8.48, we'll go to about 9.10, because that's an hour after sunset. And that's usually when it's dark enough out that you can see just about everything. It's a little bit of a problem with that tonight though, because Venus is barely above the horizon at 10 after nine. It's actually blocked right now by a tree. That could happen in your yard too. Venus is super bright, but there's an amazing thing happening. Mercury is right next to it tonight. If I go back in time a little bit, let's go back about an hour or so. When it's not completely dark out, but if I go back to where Venus and Mercury, if I do it right here, it'd be really hard to see it at this point from this location because I've got a bad landscape right there. Actually, I could switch that. Your landscape. Let's see. Okay, so now we just went somewhere else around the 40 degree north mark. Oh, that's a little bit better. Sunsets right now at 810. And if we go to about 830, oh, I can totally see Venus. But now it says Mercury, because Mercury is right there. It's right underneath it. That little tiny dot next to the bright Venus, those two are one degree apart today. That's your baby, the tip of your pinky finger at arm's length. It's called a conjunction. They're really, really close tonight. It'll be really, really neat to watch. And I want to show you why that happens. Why, why do they ever look like they're about to hit in the sky? And the fact is, they're not about to hit. They, they can't hit each other. But our, our solar system is, is set up about like this. If I, if I put it on its side, I want to show you that, that all the planets, they're kind of on the same plane. We might want to say that this shape is a plate, like a Frisbee. And all the planets go around the sun on that same plane. And well, other than the dwarf planets, all these ones that are going wonky, like way up high, there's Eris right there, it goes way up down low. Those are the dwarf planets. That's one of the reasons why dwarf planets are not regular planets, and, and that includes Pluto, because they have orbits that aren't on the same plane with all the rest of them. But if I angle it down like this, 
Um, I want you to notice, first of all, that Jupiter and Saturn are kind of in a line with the sun. Jupiter, Saturn, and actually Pluto are all three in a line with the sun. But we're not focusing on Jupiter and Saturn right now. I want to get closer. And I want you to see Earth and Mercury and Venus on April 23rd. You guys, this was a month ago. On the nighttime side of Earth, you would look out and see stars. But right over here on this part, right at the junction between sunrise and sunset. So this is right as soon as it's getting dark out. We could totally see Venus on April 23rd. It was super bright. We couldn't see Mercury at all. But if I fast forward, oh, say about a month, let's go two weeks. Let's go to May 7th. Two weeks later, Earth and Venus both moved a little bit in their orbit. Now to see Venus, we're having to skim right along the edge of the sun. In other words, it's right at sunset. We still couldn't see Mercury at all on May 7th. It's way over there. But, well, let's try to move forward a little bit. Let's go to today, two weeks later on the 21st. Here we are. This is the nighttime side of the Earth. The, the daytime side is facing away from us. I could move it around so we could see that. There's the daytime side and the nighttime side is on the back. But the way they're lined up right now, if you're a human at sunset, you can see just the edge of Venus right next to the sun, and Mercury looks like it's right next to it. That's called a conjunction. That's what we have going on tonight. And right at sunrise, if you wait for the Earth 12 hours later to be close to sunrise, you can actually look close to sunrise and see Mars. And let me zoom out a little bit. Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. When we get to morning time, we'll check that out a little bit. Um, but if I go back to April 23rd, I'll go to the 30th. And I can just let this go forward in time a little bit. Here we go. You can see the Earth rotating, and all of the planets rotating. And here they go. May. Here's mid May. Here we are at the end of May. I missed it by a couple days. On June 3rd, Venus is right underneath the sun in our view. That's called a conjunction of Venus and the sun, an inferior conjunction. We won't be able to see Venus by June 3rd at all. It'll be so close to the sun, we'll be blinded. But on the 30th, a couple days late, a couple of days before this, we go to May 30th. That's the day when we have the best view of Mercury right at sunset, right as the sun's going down, we will be able to see, that's the wrong date, not June 30th, May 30th. There we go. Right at sunset, we should be able to see Mercury. Venus will be too close to the sun. So next week will be our best chance to see Mercury in the evening sky. Well, what does that look like? Well, let's check it out. Here's tonight, May 21st at 8.30. Let's go a little bit later, so it's just a little bit darker. It's going to be low on the horizon, but pretty neat to watch. Let's stop there. So I stop time. Let's go to tomorrow night. Whoa, look at that again. So here's tonight. Look at Venus and Mercury. Watch them. Here's Venus and Mercury tonight. Here's tomorrow. Here's the next day. Here's the next day. Whoa. On May 24th, Venus will be lower than Mercury and a little tiny crescent moon will be right next to it. All three of them will be in line. Remember the moon moves around the earth. So every day it moves about an entire fist in its path. Here we go the next day, to the next day, to the next day. Oh, uh, by the 27th, we can't see Venus at all at 9, 10 p.m. But wait, on the 28th, 29th, here we are on the 30th, and Mercury is above the horizon, and I can see it. It's practically in the feet of Gemini, the twins. Let's go back to tonight and look at those constellations. Here's tonight. Here's the lines. Gemini, the twins. There's the drawings if you want to look at it that way. Leo the lion is visible towards the south-southwest. We've got the Big Dipper straight up, kind of almost behind your head from here, but pretty high in the sky. These are all the constellations that are up tonight. 
at 10 after nine. Now, if I went a step further and took out all of our light pollution, our sky would look like that. I know this is kind of neat. So I'm gonna leave it here at the super, super dark sky. Let's spin our bodies to the left. Face south tonight. Take a look at the bright stars. This is what's visible. Procyon, Regulus. Oh, Regulus is the dot in Leo the lion. That's the bottom of the backwards question mark. Arcturus, arc to Arcturus. And there's Spica in Virgo. And here are the lines. And the names of the constellations. And there's the drawings. Leo the lion up high in the south. Corvus the crow is also a very noticeable one. In my opinion, I see it from my backyard pretty regularly in the south in this time of year, early summer. Arcturus is a very bright star. It's in Bootes. It's right next to Corona Borealis, the crown of the north. That's a neat one to look for. This is everything that's up in the south tonight. You know, if we, if we fast forward a little bit, a few days, we're at a new moon tonight. And every day the sun is moving to the left compared to the sun in the sky. Remember the sun just went down in the west. If we fast forward to May 22nd, and 23rd, and 24th, and 25th, and 26th, there we have the moon. On the 27th this week, the moon is gonna be right in front of Leo the lion. On the 28th in Leo, 29th still in Leo. Ooh, then it'll be a half moon. When it's a half moon, it's right in front of Leo the lion. And then it'll head towards Spica on the 30th and go right through Virgo. So notice the moon's getting bigger as it moves across the sky. That's because it's getting farther and farther from the sun. I'm gonna go back in time to today. So the moon's gonna cross the Southern sky this week. Let's spin our bodies to the left. Now we're facing east. Let's start with these off. Our bright stars visible are Vega, Arcturus, and Spica. Vega is the brightest star in the summer sky. It's got a dangling diamond from it. It's, it's a harp, Lyra the harp. Arcturus, you can arc to Arcturus. Oh yeah, look, there's the handle of the Big Dipper. Arc to Arcturus and Spica onto Spica. Totally visible in the eastern sky tonight at 10 after 9. Corona Borealis up high in the east, right next to Arcturus. Arcturus is kind of orange in the sky. Don't be fooled thinking that it's um, Mars because it's not. Mars is visible early in the morning in the east. Let's spin to the left a little bit. We'll be facing north. Now that we're facing north, yeah, the bright stars are Vega towards the right now, Capella. Oh, we can even see Venus and Mercury again. We've done almost a full 360 degree spin. The Big Dipper is always in the north. That's the one you notice first. These two pointers guide us to the North Star and Little Dipper. Draco the Dragon kind of snakes its tail right between the Big and Little Dipper. It's not a very bright constellation. Vega is way bright in the night in the sky, in the northern sky this time of year. <clears throat> now the only thing we didn't look at were those morning planets. They're in the east, right before the sun comes up. So I need to fast forward all night long. We're just going to let time go on. Here's 10 p.m. We're going to go fast now. 11, 12, 1, 2, 3. About 4.30 in the morning, if I pause here, we've got Mars. Let's do it without these lines. The brightest things in the sky in the east, if you're up really late, or maybe this is really early, 4.20 in the morning, orange Mars is just above the horizon by 4.30. Jupiter and Saturn are quite a bit higher. Jupiter and Saturn are pretty close to each other. As a matter of fact, on December 21st this year, Jupiter and Saturn are going to be in conjunction, which means they're going to be practically touching in the sky. They're a very close conjunction this year. It's going to take a few months until Jupiter catches up with Saturn, 
But right now, every night, Jupiter is a little closer to Saturn because it's moving faster in its orbit. Mars is also up tonight. Mars is sinking a little bit to the east as well every night. And if I add in the lines and the drawings, you can see that Mars is in Aquarius, uh, the water carrier. Saturn is in Capricornus. And Jupiter is very close to both Sagittarius and Capricornus. It's kind of right in between the two. But every day they're in a slightly different position in front of the stars because these planets are in our solar system and they're moving. So that's what we've got up in the sky tonight. And I will gladly open it up to questions now. What can I answer? Uh, well, the first thing um, is not a question, but Mr. Mr. Kaplow is watching. <laughs> and he said that Starlink 8 is due after Dragon DM2 sometime in June. No idea what that means. I know you do. <laughs> you, can you say it again? You broke up yeah. a little bit. Starlink, sorry, Starlink 8 bumped to after Dragon sometime. Oh, okay. Yes. There's a Dragon, a Falcon launch, uh, a Dragon like SpaceX program is doing another launch. Um, and that's coming up 20 something, the 26th maybe. So that makes sense that they have bumped the Starlink launch until after that. So the week um, after that, or late May, early June, be on the lookout on Heavens Above or Rocket Launch Live. Um, for Actually, both of those will be neat launches to watch. Um, and they all have live streams where you can do that. Um, but the Starlink one, if you haven't seen one, is pretty cool. And I'm trying to bring about an awareness here that um, a parade of lights across the sky all in a row, it might look to you like, like six, eight, 10, 12, 20 airplanes all in a row. That's not what they are. It's not airplanes and it's definitely not UFOs. That's what the Starlink launches look like when that program launches off their set of 60 satellites at, at once. So thanks for that, Bob. Yes. Um, now this question is kind of exciting because I love new discoveries. Me too. Um, and so this student is wondering if you think we would ever find any new constellations. Hmm. Uh, you know what? I don't think we'll ever find any new constellations. Like we as humans have been studying the sky, well, ever since there's been humans. And, and if you were to break up the sky into sections, kind of like how we break up the United States into states, the whole sky is already broken up into 88 constellations. So, so there's no section of the sky that humans haven't looked at. But what we will probably find new are things like the stronger and better our telescopes look, the farther they can see. The more a telescope can zoom in on something, the farther we're looking. So as telescopes get better and optics get better and things look clearer, we're gonna find more and more things in the constellations that we didn't know were there before. That is a good question. And it definitely yeah, reminds me of, of the planets. Lots, we, we have thousands and thousands of, of planets that have been um, discovered around stars that we can just look up at in the night sky, the stars. We can look at stars, but with our eyes, we can't tell if there's planets going around them. But scientists have devised ways now that they can observe with special telescopes or really sensitive equipment that stares at a star for a long time. And they've detected thousands of exoplanets out there. Wow, that's really cool. Um, this student would like to know what the this site is called. And I think they're talking about the Stellarium. Yep, it's called Stellarium. And here I can show you what the icon looks like right here. Stellarium. There's a web version where you don't even need to download it onto your computer. Of course, it doesn't have as many features. If you download it, it's free. Um, it's safe and it's called Stellarium. It looks like that. Very cool. Um, and then we got um, a, a comment or a question. Earthquakes in Illinois? Because you, yeah, yeah, because you talked about oh. Yes, as a matter of fact, yes. And 
Earth earthquakes can be felt in Illinois. Oh, not very often. Um, we had one a couple of years ago. I know we had a pretty good one about 10, 12 years ago. Oh, there's a fault line way down in Southern Illinois. Oh, if you live in the Southern part of Illinois, they feel earthquakes all the time down there. They're not big ones, but they just shake the ground a little bit. Um, and we can get strong ones. And I'm trying to remember the year of the big new Madrid um, fault movement. Um, but that was probably in the mind of the people who were building the telescope and thought, wow, if there's a big one, we don't want this telescope to move at all. So right. one of the other things they did, they dug a 60 foot hole, poured concrete in it, and then they set the telescope on top of it. So that telescope is in 60 feet of concrete down as deep as it can go um, so that it never ever would shift or move because there was an earthquake or a big gravel truck drove by or a big heavy rainstorm washed out some dirt. It stays in the same exact spot. And then keeping with the planetarium, there was another question about, um, you showed a photo of a building that was built around the concrete, um, I forget what it's called now, the word is escaping me, and yep. the others, um, that building's no longer there. Uh, but why did they, they want to know why did you build the building? Or why was the building built? And then um, why did it need a light? The building was built around that monument and the monument was put there to mark the exact location of exact north from the center of the telescope. And they called it the Mark House because they knew they wanted to install a really bright light right at the same level as the telescope so that every night when they opened up the telescope, sorry, I thought that would be faster okay. or not. They opened it up every night, aimed the telescope right at that mark house, and they looked for that light to be exactly, exactly in the middle of the eyepiece of the telescope. And if it wasn't, something moved. And that monument that's inside here is also dug in a deep, deep base of concrete. So that shouldn't have moved. The telescope shouldn't have moved. So they would have to do a little research and try to figure out what needs to be adjusted because they had to make sure that the telescope was exactly lined up due north and south. Every time you aimed it up above your head and then back behind you, it had to be exactly on that imaginary line that we, that we put over our head that connects the North Pole to the South Pole. Kind of like if you took a string and tied it to the end of the North Pole of the Earth and then strung it over your head and then tied it to the tip of the South Pole behind you, that line in the sky is called the meridian. And this telescope had to aim exactly at that line at all times in order to make accurate measurements of the stars going by. So that's yeah. why I built it. And of course the wood, the building is made out of wood. So it, it basically fell apart and they took it down. Um, mm -hmm. But the monument that they built around it it's still there. I think that was earlier that I showed that. No, nope, it was later. Yeah. So that's the monument and the Mark House is what it was called. It's like a big shed was built around it right there. Wow. Good question. Yes, it was. It, um, I'd never noticed that before. As many times as I've watched the presentation, I didn't know about the Mark House. Oh, yeah. Mr. Campbell. Um, oh, that, oh uh, to answer that question. Well, hold on. To answer that question. The, they had a very, very bright, special, special light that was electric, and it had electric cords and stuff to it, and they had to protect it. They couldn't just put the light um, on that concrete outside, and storms and snow and wind and lightning would hit it, so they built the house around it to protect the light source that was going to be inside. Uh, all right, that makes sense. Um, Mr. Kaplow, again, with, he just wanted to let everybody know that the DM2 is the first manned launch. Uh, for the USA, nine years. So that will be a nice for people to watch. Yes. Excellent. And Mr. Kaplow is a fantastic solar system ambassador, and he's a rocket, rocket expert. He's a rocket launcher. So he knows this stuff, and I appreciate that information. The first manned mission in nine years. That's great to hear. Yes. Um, so here's a really good question. Um, 
can we get new planets? So, you know, yeah. I, I think they're thinking, you know, in our solar system, could we get a new planet? But maybe they mean, can we find new planets? Yeah, that's two different questions and kind of answered the one already. But can we find new planets in the solar system? Uh, the answer is generally no, but there's exceptions. And right now, there are some scientists at some leading observatories that found some evidence gravitationally, how things move, knowing what we know about gravity and Barry centers, that, that there appears to be the possibility that way, way, way beyond Pluto, there's another large object going around the sun that might qualify as a planet. They haven't seen it. They've only seen evidence of it. So scientists all over the world right now are on the lookout. And if it's found in the next few years, oh, we'll hear about it on the news. So at the <laughs> moment, they're just calling it Planet Nine uh, because we don't know what else to call it because we don't even know for sure if it's there. Uh, but that's how science works. It's not always as simple and cut and dried and yes, there it is and no, there it isn't. So the answer to that is right now they're looking for Planet Nine, but at the moment, there's just the eight planets and then what we call our dwarf planets and the asteroids and comets and meteoroids that make up our solar system. We had a question last week about the hexagon and I know you did some research to learn about it. I thought maybe we might show everybody. Um, yeah, we could follow up on well, that. Here we yeah. Go. That's the fun thing about doing something like this and, and the fun thing about being a scientist is, you know, we don't know everything. And uh, sometimes we have to do new research too. Yep. And I often use Earth Sky as a resource for this kind of um, research, some, somewhere to start. Um, and I definitely see a hexagon shape there on the top of Saturn. It's been known for a long time. It's been seen for a long time. Cassini's taken a lot of pictures and, and taken a lot of data from it. Uh, there's a swirling like hurricane in the center. Um, it's made of gases and tiny little particles. Um, but instead of being perfectly round at the edges, this hurricane has these flat parts. And it's almost like a, a jet stream is guiding these gases that are swirling into this shape. And here's a high re about as high resolution as we can get image from Cassini, color enhanced of this general movement. And not only is this like a huge hurricane, within the hurricane, there's little swirling hurricanes. There's one there, there's one there. There's one there. They get bigger and more obvious. Sometimes they blur away. That one was hard to see, and then it's a little easier to see here. So this is the top of Saturn, and there's definitely a hexagon shape there. And they don't really know for sure why it's happening, but they're doing research. They're first looking at what it is, and it's hazy sandwiched layers of gases that are on top of the pole of Saturn. Isn't that interesting? It is. It's really, really cool. I'm so glad that that student uh, asked us that question. Yeah. About this, um, you know, phenomenon. It's pretty cool. Um, I don't know if people, um, if young people understand, and maybe, maybe adults too, um, how famous the Watch Factory is. Um, I know I told, I shared with you last summer, um, we went on a vacation and I went to a Titan, we went to a Titanic museum and at the end of the Titanic museum, they listed the survivors and it listed, um, a survivor who actually ended up working at the Elgin one was listed on her, on her card with her picture, um, that she then, um, you know, came back to the United States and, and got a job with the Elgin Watch Factory. So, you know, when you're out and about this summer and you're looking around, find those connections because um, the Elgin Watch Factory not only was important to us in Elgin, but actually was pretty famous um, all around the world. Yes. And a, a lot of you listening, grandmas, great grandmas, great great grandparents that um, had a watch, owned one, chances are, it was an Elgin watch. I mean, at one time, there were thousands of workers in that factory every single day. And uh, it, it partly made Elgin into what it is today. So Elgin is famous because of the watches and the watches are famous because there's this huge, amazing factory. 
And the observatory is the last standing piece of that factory. And these are scenes from inside the radio room where they would transmit the radio signal when that became a thing in the 1920s. And they would transmit the time from Elgin all around the world. And that's what this image is showing. And, and the time, it, transmitting time is what made them famous. And the observatory is still standing. And I wanna make sure, I mean, we, we do, you know, we do school programs. But once a quarter, um, Mrs. Hernandez offers public shows. And so when this pandemic is um, sort of behind us and things are opening up, um, you know, keep your eye out for the public shows and come see these things for yourself. Um, really interesting. And Mrs. Hernandez does such a good job. Um, I wonder if um, you have any final thoughts. There is one last question. It's 201. What do you think? Do you want to take the question? Go for it. And then do your closing thoughts. Um, do you think we're going to be able to go to a different planet? So okay. I, well, I, I know there's plans to go to Mars. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic. Like, I hope it happens. I think it's going to happen. I'm not sure that it's going to happen in our lifetime, but maybe. And that would be Mars. Mars is the only possibility at the moment. No other planet um, has conditions that would allow us to actually land on it. Yeah, very cool. Any parting thoughts? Um, I do the public shows about four or five times every school year. They're in the evening and you are able to walk around the entire building, including some displays in the basement that are set up with um, just neat old parts of the factory and what the building did. So um, the, not only is there a planetarium program, but you can walk around the building um, at that time. And this video is yeah. called The House of Wonders from Accidentally Preserved. It's a really neat 22 minute video on, on the watch company and that little segment on the observatory is in there too. Um, lots of scenes from inside what it was look like to work in the factory. Um, back in the day when the Elgin Watch Company was so huge. Well, thank you very much. And, and thanks, thanks to all everybody. of our watchers. Yep, thanks for all these, especially the regular watchers. I, I know I think we had a Francisco. I think we had several students that watched every single week. Have a great summer. Don't forget to watch the sky and be on the lookout for public shows next year. And I'll see everybody later. Bye. Bye.